In this clip, we will focus on the geometric interpretation of the singular value decomposition. We will introduce that interpretation by an example. We will use the famous iris dataset, and that consists of iris flowers. We have three different species, the Cetosa, Virginica, and Versicolor flower. And uh, we measure the length and the width of sepal leaves and the length and the width of petal leaves, two types of, flowers, uh, two types of leaves of this, this flower. For didactical reasons, we will restrict ourselves in this clip to a subset of the data. We will only focus on the Virginica species, and we will only consider three different variables, the sepal length, the sepal width, and the petal length. And this will allow us to visualize the entire data matrix in 3D. Then we can do a singular value decomposition, try to grasp what the singular value decomposition means in this three-dimensional space, and then we will use a truncated SVD. So we will uh, reduce the dimensionality and we will go from three dimensions to two dimensions and we will see what that means in this uh, geometric space. We first will take the subset of the data. So we take the famous iris data set, we subsample the Virginica species, and then we select the sepal length, the sepal width and the petal length, and we are ready with our original subset of the data. We will now visualize this data in three dimensions and we clearly see that this data is a kind of a cloud of points in this three-dimensional space. This cloud of points is uh, located at um, a mean of 3.2 for the sepal width, uh, sepal, width uh, sepal length, a mean of 6.9 for the sepal width and then a mean of 5.7 for the pupil length. And, um, before we do the SVD, we typically first center the data. That means that we will subtract the, the, mean, the, the column means from the data. So the, we will subtract from the data the, the mean of the sepal length, the sepal width, and the petal length. And then we will translate the cloud of points to the origin. So this is the second step of the analysis. We, we, sub we center the data by using the scale function in R. We set scale equal to false so that we do not rescale the data according to the variance of each, um, of each coordinate or each dimension. We simply subtract the mean of it. And then we have translated the cloud of points to the origin. And if we look to the result uh, of this uh, vector x, uh, of this matrix x, we clearly see that this is now a cloud of points that is centered around zero. I will also put the original um, coordinate system on it, on top of the graph in gray, and the, co the or coordinate system is uh, centered in 0, 0, 0, and we have three axes, the uh, y-axis, uh, sepal width, the x-axis, sepal length, and the z-axis, the petal length. So this is how the data looks like, uh, and how these dimensions look like. And we clearly see, if we look, and rotate the plot, we clearly see that the points um, of the data are nicely scattered around zero. They are nicely centered at zero. And this is, of course, because we have subtracted the means uh, from the data. We are now ready to go one step further and to do the singular value decomposition. So we can decompose this matrix according to this famous method. We will take our center theta and we simply use the SVD function in R to do that. And after we have done that, we can subtract the uh, right singular vectors from the data and we can also uh, subtract uh, the projections um, of the data in this new space that is spanned by the singular vectors. In this application, we focus on the right singular vectors because the right singular vectors are related to the original dimensions in the data, the sepal length, the sepal width, and uh, the petal length. And uh, we basically, in this three-dimensional space that is spanned by the, the singular vectors, we basically will look at a kind of a rotation in, in this original space. So we will rotate the original space to a new coordinate system that is spanned by our three singular vectors that we have. So SVD is nothing else than rotating the data in a new way so that you have another representation of the data. The nice thing about SVD is that the most, the first dimension contains the largest amount of information in the data. 
The second dimension is orthogonal on top of that, and it contains the second largest information content in the data. So we basically can reduce the dimensions uh, from P to K, in our case from 3 to 2, by, uh, by uh, getting rid of the higher dimensions in this singular value decomposition. So we will truncate the singular value decomposition. We, can, we will first look to the original singular value decomposition. So we had three coordinate systems, x, y, and z. And we will go to a new coordinate system, v1, v2, and v3. And they are also orthogonal onto each other. And we basically only have a rotation, which is clearly indicated here. So we basically rotate this axis system a little bit to have uh, another representation of the data. And then we can project every data point on this new coordinate system. And then we get this course z1, z2, and z2 is 3, z1 for the score on the first eigenvector, uh, direction of the first eigenvector, uh, v2, z2 the score on the second eigenvector, and v3 the score on the third eigenvector. We can now also plot the data on top of that, and then we will see some very cool features of the SVD. We will see that it, the first dimension is indeed capturing the largest information content in the data. If we rotate the data a little bit, and if we zoom in a little bit, we basically clearly see that uh, this uh, vector v1 is pointing in the direction of the largest variability that we see in the data. And uh, this is why it is capturing so much information. If we then look at v2, v2 is orthogonal on top of it, and it is pointing in the second largest dimension of the uh, 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 direction of the largest variability. And v3 is perpendicular uh, or orthogonal on v1 and v2, and it is port pointing into the third largest source of variability in the data, and they are all orthogonal to each other. If we keep all these eigenvectors, we only have a trans uh, rotation, we have a new coordinate system with new coordinates, these z values. And that's all what it is. The nice thing is that we can now go to a lower dimensional representation of the data in two dimensions, for example, so that we can make 2D plots. And we simply do that by uh, kicking out the higher dimensions, and these higher dimensions are less informative than these first dimensions, which capture most of the variability in the data. So what is the geometric interpretation of this truncated SVD? So we already have an idea on a new coordinate system. Taking the original points, projecting it in the new coordinate system gives us the scores, the C values. And we will now go to the geometric interpretation of the truncated SVD. With the truncated SVD, we basically can only we basically can have a kind of a compressed data compression by having a reduced representation of the original data. The, we will look at a representation of the original data that spans a kind of a subspace of the original p-dimensional space. A subspace that is only spanned by k dimensions, in our case, k is 2. So we have a two-dimensional um, um, two um, approximation of this uh, p-dimensional data matrix. How do we do that? We simply do that by only uh, using the first k eigen vectors and the first k eigen values. It's as simple as that. And then we basically know uh, that uh, this uh, representation is nothing else than the scores in this two-dimensional space, in our case, uh, back multiplied by the transpose of the matrix of the two eigen vectors, in our case, k is 2. One of the things that we also have seen in the theory uh, was something that was very nice. We have seen in the theory that we could go immediately from the original data to this low dimensional representation by simply back multiplying the original data, projecting the original data in this uh, space that is spanned by these two or this k uh, eigenvectors. So we will take every row every data point, so every row is a data point, is a flower. We will take every flower in X and we will project the vector that we have for this flower onto the vector that is spanned by the first eigenvector and by the second eigenvector. And then we get 
a score for the first flower on the first A vector and a score for the second flower on the second A vector. This is how it works. And we have proven that this projection is indeed correct because of the orthogonality, uh, orthonormality property of the singular value decomposition with orthonormal uh, singular vectors. Um, and that was a very cool thing. We have now seen that these projections are nothing else than vector multiplications. If we multiply two vectors, if we take the inner product of two vectors, we get a projection of one vector onto, on, onto the other, an orthogonal projection of these vectors. And we will now show you geometrically what that means in this three-dimensional space so that you have a better interpretation on what the, the original uh, scores are, the x values are, in order to know what these um, z values are, what the eigenvectors are, and in order to know what this low dimensional representation of the data is. So um, I will first show you that um, this uh, projection of the original data on these two eigenvectors is indeed exactly equivalent to the zk values that we have obtained directly from the SVD. So I take my original data, I project them on the first two eigenvectors that I have extracted from uh, the singular value decomposition object that I have, and then I have a new projection matrix. And I compare my new projection matrix with the original projection matrix that I immediately could calculate from the SVD. And we see that the difference between uh, all the values in these two matrices are within the uh, machine tolerance. So they are very, very small. So they are, yeah, numerical um, um, rounding errors. So they are equivalent. And we will now show you what this projection means. And we will take one data point, one for one flower, for flower 44, the 44th row, row of x, and we will project it on these two uh, eigenvectors. And we will see what this result is. We will do that in this three-dimensional space. The blue dot in the three-dimensional space that we have is um, the, the original data point, the red data point, uh, that we have is the new data point that we get, get, get in this new low dimensional representation of the data that is spanned by only two eigenvectors. The uh, third eigenvector is indicated with a dotted line because we will not use that in this low dimensional rep representation. We will kick out this dimension. So if we zoom in in the data a little bit, we basically see the following thing. We see that we start from the data we start from the data, the original data. We project the original data point orthogonally on the direction that is spanned by the first A in vector. Um, and then the length that we get onto this end, onto this direction is this Z value. So the Z value is the length that we have from zero up to this projected point. We will now do a similar projection of the data point onto the second eigenvector. And then we get Z2, that is the length from 0 until uh, the value that we have obtained for this projection. And we will only maintain these two coordinates in our new coordinate system that is spanned by Z1, by V1 and V2, the first two eigenvectors. So we clearly see here that uh, we now have a low dimen lower dimensional projection that is living in the space that is spanned by these two eigenvectors. So that's what we basically have, that they are spanned in the space by these two, uh, they, they live in the space that is spanned by these two eigenvectors. And we also see that we lose a little bit of the information, we lose the information that was available in the original data point according to the directions of the remaining singular values and in vectors, and we only have a one singular vector that is remaining here, Z3, and we basically see that we get, yeah, that we lose this information. So we will approximate the blue data point with the red data point, and we approximate the, the, the data points in a two-dimensional plane that is spanned in this three-dimensional space. And that's what happens with the SVD. We also see that because we do not use this third dimension that we basically project the data 
along to the third dimension orthogonally into this plane. So this is what effectively uh, happens. And uh, because uh, because of the fact that the first dimension is pointing in the largest sort of variability and the second dimension in the second largest sort of variability, we will contain as much information as possible on the original data. We can now do that not only for one data point, we can now do that for all the data points, for all the rows on X, and then we get basically get projections of all the data points, and the projections are indicated over here. I will again zoom in into the data uh, a little bit, and we basically see that we have that we have projections of the original data onto um, the space that is spanned by the A vectors, and we can see that a little bit more clearly if we rotate the data a little bit, and then we clearly see if you look onto this plane according to the direction of V2, then we see the direction of V1, then we clearly see that these data points indeed live in a, in a plane. And we see that they are projected along, this, uh, along, along the direction of, uh, or parallel with the direction of V3 into this plane. And we also see clearly that, um, that a, lot of, a lot of the information is maintained in this first dimension that is spanning a lot of the variability of the data. We can do the same thing for the second dimension and we see that the variability in the second dimension is a, is, is a little bit smaller than the original variability that we had in the first dimension. So the, the range is a little bit smaller, so we have less variability there. And we see that we lose some information, we lose the information of the data points that are scattered around this two-dimensional plane and that's what we lose and we sacrifice that for a better interpretation because then we can graphically see what happens in the data. A last representation that I have is a representation where I only contain the projected data points, uh, these data points uh, that live in the space and I have both the original um, axes as the new axis coordinate system that we use in this plot. And we see the, the new coordinate system only has two coordinates. The original coordinates has three coordinates. And we can go from the, from the original coordinates to the new coordinates by projecting the data uh, into this plane. Or we can go back to the original coordinates by projecting the projected points back into onto each of these axes x1, x2, and x3. And we can do that by... Um, by uh, multiplying the z values, the, the values that we have in this new coordinate system, with the transpose of the uh, of the um, of the singular vector matrix uh, with the first two a vectors, and this is how we can go back and forth from z the z space to the x space. And we see that these data points are indeed living in this plane. So this is very, uh, we can see that very easily if we rotate a little bit in the, in the data. So we basically see that we have a kind of a low dimensional representation and that we can basically look in two dimensions to interpret patterns in this plot. And this is how the geometric interpretation of the singular value decomposition works and how projecting vectors onto each other are working. I hope that this um, clip has made this a little bit more clear. I also have provided um, a kind of a, a script of um, this uh, analysis that I have performed here so that you also can explore these 3D figures yourself to get a better interpretation and a grip onto the nice properties of the truncated singular value decomposition.